and I'm the CEO of Elementa. And this is our Sunday Women's Wellness. Oh, I keep saying webinar because it's alliteration, yeah, but yeah. I think it's more like a like a conversation and gathering. <laughs> so we are holding these, or I am hosting these every Wednesday and every Sunday. And it's part because we love sharing information. We love connecting you with experts and authors regarding wellness, uh, regarding health. And it's also partly for my sanity <laughs> to stay busy at this time while I'm still uh, sheltering at home and not even my own home, but uh, my in-laws home. <laughs> so I'm a little bit displaced. I normally live in Anchorage, Alaska, and I'm currently in the Seattle area. So I usually go into a whole lot of things of what to expect coming up next, but I really want to get into this conversation. So instead of reading a bio, I am going to ask Melody Moisey, who is here today, to introduce herself, and then we're going to dive right into talking about her book, The Roomy <laughs> Prescription. Okay. Thank you so much ha for having me. Um, I My name is Melody Moisey. I'm an author, an attorney, an activist. I'm an Iranian-American Muslim feminist. Um, I live with bipolar disorder. I'm currently in Wilmington, North Carolina, where I teach creative writing. Um, and I live between here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. So, and I'm originally from Iran, so. And a lot of <laughs> your background is covered in your book. I have not read your previous book, which okay. was also a memoir, is that? Yes, so there's one about having bipolar disorder and there's one about young Muslim Americans. Okay. Yes. And the, like my children, I have to bring them, them all so they can all be seen. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, and I'm glad you did. And I, and I have to say, I love having your book with me right now. I ordered it online, had it delivered to me because obviously I couldn't go to the bookstore uh, at this time. If you're watching this later, you'll know that uh, there, there was a time when we could not leave our homes or go into retail <laughs> places. And hopefully when you're watching this in the future and not too distant future, you're in a bookstore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but since I couldn't, it was delivered. And the first thing I want to say as we begin speaking about your book is, I don't know what they did to it, but there's something so tactile and lovely yeah. about this texture of your cover that they did they tell you what they did? They just did a brilliant job with the cover overall. There were like a lot of, there was a lot of iterations of options for covers. Mm -hmm. um, and they really listened. The, it's the nightingale on the front is, um, the, mm -hmm. the national bird of Iran is a nightingale. Um, and oh. there's, a, yeah. So there's a poem in the book uh, that mm -hmm. is, though the song of the nightingale, you may learn to compose you still can't know what it sings to the rose. So the message of that being, don't be a nightingale if you're not a nightingale, be what you are. <laughs> be who you are. Be don't you. bother. Be you're you. not, even if you try and imitate a nightingale, you're still not going to understand what it's saying to the rose. So, yeah. Oh, excellent. Well, I also mean the tactile feel of the cover. I don't know yeah. if it's just so silky. It's yeah. weird. I don't, I, I don't know what it is, but there's something... You know, I miss books. I miss yeah. solid yeah. paper back, hard covered books uh, with all the digital reading that we're doing. So I was really grateful to get this. It's been an amazing companion. Um, I think one of the first things I wanted to talk about was I couldn't understand at first what the roommate prescription was, but then there's a literal theme throughout the book of your father writing roomy quotes on prescription pads because he's a doctor yes yeah and I'm curious just as a writer this is first just to indulge yeah. my my writer self did you have the I, concept of the prescriptions sort of first if you will with an outline of the various things because your chapters are all 
diagnoses mm-hmm. and then medical prescription diagnoses and then medical prescri- prescription or was that something that evolved as you were writing it that evolved that was it definitely didn't start off like that initially i wanted it to be i didn't know what i wanted it to be i knew that there was something powerful in this literary and cultural and spiritual inheritance of mine as an iranian american um and knowing that, you know, my Farsi is not good, as good as my parents. uh, But growing up, my dad was constantly reciting this poetry to me. Uh, And in Persian culture, that's actually quite common. Like I'm not the only one (laughs) whose dad recites poetry. It's a very macho thing. Like to recite poetry is actually, um, it's, I think in, in American culture, maybe it's considered feminine. It's, not, I guess, in, in there, I, some of, in Farsi, there's actually no gender. There's no he or she. Hmm. Um, everyone's it. Uh, and I think that infiltrates the culture as well. Um, for instance, being transgender in Iran, uh, is, uh, the government helps you. Uh, they recognize being transgender. Uh, granted, they're, they're, it's v- deeply problematic because they also recognize it as a cure for homosexuality. <laughs> okay. um, there you go. But no, no one I've ever heard of has been like forced into that cure by the government. But I do know Iranian Americans here who are transgender who have gone back to Iran um, to have surgery, for instance, if you mm-hmm. know they were interested in doing that, and the Iranian government paid for it because uh, mm-hmm. they were Iranian citizens. Um, U.S. government doesn't do that. So, <laughs> uh, and it's actually, I think, maybe the second or third uh, highest rate of for transgender surgery specifically, um, it, most commonly done. Anyway, point being, I, I think there is something wonderful about not having gender uh, in your language. Uh, nobody has to worry about these are my pronouns because everyone has the same pronouns. Um, mm-hmm. And God never has a gender either. So in Persian, which Rumi wrote in, uh, n- never had to bother with that. I had to, in translation, decide how was I going to refer to the beloved capital B, referring to what I understand as God. Mm-hmm. Um, we also don't really have capital letters, but the words sort of end with capital letters, if you want to put it that way. But anyway, huh. the beloved, um, I, I refer to as it. Whenever I use a pronoun, which I don't do that often. Yeah, you didn't I, I really. Use, yeah. yeah, I use the capital I-T, which was some editorial questions around that. But I was like, no, nope, I'm not doing he. It's not he in Farsi. <laughs> right, right. Well, and, and the, and the yeah. idea that you use beloved, uh, that I found that throughout the book, I have to say what struck me is this, at, at in, in a way, is a deeply spiritual book and one could even say religious if you don't put a sort of societal construct around religion and yet I didn't feel put off at all your use of the word beloved I had never heard that um, as sort of the almighty or as we say some of us some of us Mm -hmm. say god or higher power but Mm -hmm. beloved I just I loved it. It just warmed me every time you said it. And I noticed that it was mostly the beloved as opposed to. Well, Rumi does that. That's not me. That's Rumi. He does, he does Mashur. Mashur is the beloved. Um, And he has a poem where he says, uh, Oh, I know which one that is. Come, you don't, come. you know which one that is? Yeah, at the end of it says come, come. But you, yes, but you, B-I-E, B-I-E. B-I-E. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is that is like it's next door to you. The beloved is next yes, door. Yes, the beloved is right, right here. I'm deeply impressed. <gasps> oh, um, well, yes, the beloved is right next I was door. Com- I was comparing the back where there is much more of the translation and sort and all of the references and all. Right. And, and that one had spoken to me in sort of the English version, which was the yeah. translation, which was a little bit more about your neighbors right next door. Right. So I had just noticed that and it just stuck. And I me. did. That's one of the few ones that I actually wrote out of the transliterated Farsi in the text. Yes. Um, but I'm amazed that you <laughs> remember that. That's really impressive. <laughs> well, I just, uh, I have to say, this spoke to me on so many levels. Uh, and 
there's there's so many things that we have to cover. So I, I don't want to fill this hour with my own stories, but I will just briefly say for those of you who are watching and listening live and then later on the recording is that uh, I personally have been dealing with over the many years with depression. I think uh, based on your book, it's maybe referred to as unipolar depression. Yeah, yeah. And uh, did not even know that to my 40s when I had my child and had postpartum depression and then realized what I had been experiencing postpartum was just an amplification of what I've experienced all my life, untreated. And then uh, my daughter has been experiencing a lot of mental health issues as well. So I'm sort of in the throes right now. And I have been for the last couple of years with trying to help her be well. So honestly, I found you on Twitter, I think through Ellen Forney, another oh, author. She, we're good friends. She's amazing. I love her. Yeah. And so I was following things that she was following and then there you were. And so I, I actually invited you here for purely selfish reasons. As well. well, not purely, but for also selfish reasons. So a lot to explore. Um, for anyone who has not read the book yet, if I were to encapsulate it and I want to hear whether or not this resonates with you, Melody, because obviously it's your book. <laughs> but the way that I, I, I would explain it to someone who didn't know is that the book is a memoir, a story of parts of your life, parts of Melody's life, um, as she takes a pilgrimage. And I think that you didn't even quite know you were taking a pilgrimage, maybe when this took shape, um, guided by her father, um, and rooted in, actually rooted in getting to the root, getting mm -hmm. to the root of self. Asla, asla, yeah. Through Rumi, through the, the words of the poetry of the, the mysticism of Rumi. Uh, and, and that each of his quotes and um, poetry that you're quoting within are like the prescriptions for different yeah. diagnoses, such as wanting, isolation, haste, depression, anxiety, anger, each chapter being that. So it's your journey, it's your pilgrimage to get to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's to, to the, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, that was a beautiful description of it. Yeah. And not just within me, but the beloved within me and within all of us that connects us, that's unique within each of us, but also really that connection with something that when I had my f first and only thus far acute manic episode, that sense of being deeply connected to every other person through this divinity within myself uh, and within every other living thing uh, was so strong. And part of the book was just running after that, run because without the madness. So having the acute mania, the beauty of that is, you know, I happen to have a mystical experience, which many people uh, with mental health conditions uh, do experience those sorts of things. Um, and often we're dismissed uh, and told that it's not valid. Uh, my perception of that is somebody who believes in science and medicine, who is the daughter of two physicians, uh, is that uh, absolutely, I have clinical bipolar disorder, and I take treat. I take medication for that. I do lifestyle alterations for that. I sleep. And sleep is the most important thing in my life uh, mm -hmm. as a result of that. So uh, there are definitely ways that I treat it as a medical condition. But I also know that something about my brain working differently means that I have experienced this beautiful. Uh, thing that I would never give up, just being able to, very similar to what people describe as, I've never used psych psychedelics, but uh, people talk about psychedelic experiences and feeling very united, um, and just this deep sense of everything's okay. Like it's, and not just as it's okay, like it's exactly the way that it's supposed to be. Um, and just what an amazing feeling to have, like you I just, I've never felt more confident that everything that was happening was exactly the way that it was supposed to be happening. Um, even though like, <laughs> like it was an acute mania is not something I recommend. Um, but I knew I, something within me knew that there was a purpose to this. Um, and, and part of that was to have this mystical experience. And then years later uh, was when I decided I would actively pursue mysticism uh, because in that situation, I think part of why I ended up having 
the acute manic episode was that I did not prepare. So most mystics, they prepare for any sort of what we call fanat, which is just the annihilation of the ego. I had not prepared at all. I, you know, they prepare by preparing, I mean, through fasting, through prayer, through pilgrimage, through um, what we personally, uh, you know, Sufism is the mysticism of Islam. So as a Muslim, like through the five pillars of Islam, um, that's, that's how they prepare. Uh, me, they prepare for with lots of silence, sometimes years. Um, yeah, I had done none of that and just sort of stumbled into this land of fana, of the annihilation of the ego for a brief moment and was deeply burned by it very quickly. And then it turned into this clinical condition, which again, I believe in both the clinical side of it and the mystical side of it. And I don't think that they're mutually exclusive or mm -hmm. contradictory. Uh, and I wish our mental health system would understand that. And I wish our faith communities could understand that so that our faith communities could stop saying to us, you're possessed and traumatizing us with that. Um, and and I've, I've seen that in all sorts of different faith communities happen. Uh, and so, you know, the mental health community would respect our faith and our unique abilities as conduits. Um, well, you're seeing, because, things, you're seeing things that others are not seeing or, or perceiving and processing in ways that others are not doing. And I, I always hesitate to use the word normal, like yeah. normal yeah, people, yeah. because yeah. that is not true. And so I think, and this goes back to something that's in your book, that there is lots, a lot of fear. So when something is different, someone is different, whether it's a thought process or an individual, skin color, whatever, mm -hmm. different, then the, it's unknown and then there is fear. And it's how do we process that fear? Well, when it's an institution like a mental uh, health establishment, yeah, there is still lots of fear there. It's all yeah. very fear-based. And oh, yeah. having now been through that process with my daughter, I watch how they actually try to instill fear. <sighs> yeah. So as a parent trying to keep my daughter safe, they're instilling fear in me and telling me all of these horrible and terrible things and the potentialities. And I'm sitting here looking at the promise and the gifts and the yeah. beauty uh, and the loveliness of my child who is in pain, who is suffering. Yeah. And I want to get to the root of that as opposed to creating fear. Right. And so uh, one of the things you mentioned too, some the thing that the annihilation of the ego, that's in your book as well. The idea of dying before you die, of killing the ego. So is it madness or is it mysticism? If those who are mystics are looking to get rid of their ego, just to, to mm. block that so they can connect more. Someone who is mad, someone who is crazy, deemed mentally ill, like a psychedelic trip, it could be the removal of the walls. Right. And the permeability, the permeable between what's inside and what's outside. Yeah. It's sort of moving back and forth where, and maybe that's where delusion comes in, where it's much more permeable. Those of us yeah. who think we're sane mm -hmm. really have these incredibly rigid walls, the ego, the limited. Yeah. And I think it's just, it's sort of like the way I describe it, um, mostly to people who are more like, spiritual because it, it sounds a little woo-woo and, and other people may not get it, but I feel like you'll get it, um, is just that I genuinely believe that I and other people who have access, who have certain mental health conditions that lead them to mysticism, um, have access to different planes of reality that are deeply inconvenient and in fact impossible long-term in this reality. Hmm. So I do, I'm not saying that what I experienced in terms of delusion and some of them, yeah, some of them ju were just bad shit. I mean, I can't, like, I well, something about, oh, so, so in the book you do describe yeah. kind of vaguely. Yeah. So I wasn't a hundred percent sure if maybe you went more into it in your previous book, but you yeah. do describe, I think you're, I want, I, I'm remembering maybe on a balcony, there's a sunset, yeah. mm -hmm. um, the golden light, but then there was a moment where you thought you could fly. Yeah. Yeah. Very dangerous. Um, yeah. And on yeah. one realm of reality, that's possible. 
mm-hmm. um, is mm-hmm. what I'm saying is just, it could be possible that in, you know, there is a place where that's possible in a reality where that's possible. Um, we but just, maybe it's, but maybe it's not it. even, yeah, but maybe it's not even <laughs> yeah. the physical flight, like a bird. Right. Maybe it is fly in a sort of spiritual, spiritual. freedom. Yeah. yeah. That is also not re- yeah. often possible in this reality. Yeah. Right, right. And I think the problem of not being prepared for something like that and just falling into a mental health crisis that many cultures uh, have consistently viewed as sort of a the birth of a guide the birth of a sheikh or a sheikha or a, a guru, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there, there are certain cultures in which w- when you fall apart, when you break apart in that way um, and you lose touch with reality, that's a sign of an access point, just a place where you're capable. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas this society we live in sees it instead of a, a point at which we are capable of unique things that other people generally are not, they see it as a unique por- point at which we are disabled in ways that other right. people are not. So it, mm-hmm. it can be disabling, but what's disabling is frequently the way society treats it. Exactly how you were talking, um, how our mental health system treats mental illness is far crazier yeah. than anybody inside that system yeah. could ever be. Um, we put people, for instance, in solitary confinement and we do it more than any other country on the planet Mm -hmm. and we do it for treatment and we do it for punishment. Uh, despite the fact that it's very clear, all the data show that it is not just ineffective, but actually counterproductive. It induces symptoms of mental illness in people who don't already have it. Um, and yet we use it to treat mental illness. So, um, that kind of sort of the opposite of evidence-based medicine that's being practiced uh, is, you know, you can't call us crazy and then do those sorts of things. You can't call us crazy and then let us know that our largest mental health facilities in the United States are jails and prisons, right? You're the crazy one. And I think we're seeing that out in the streets right now um, as, as we're recording this, um, we're in June of 2020. Um, the year of the apocalypse, as far as we know. Uh, <laughs> and now, yes. Uh, I mean, what, what do you call what's happening in the streets? It's it's part protest, uh, very valid. Yeah. Part rioting, uh, which I don't think is at the heart of the protest or protesters, mm-hmm. um, and a ton of brutality. Yeah, and it's police uh, brutality, and I think the rioting brutality. is police rioting for the most part. Um, or, what pol- or police instigated rioting. <laughs> yes. So either police rioting or, I mean, when you have people, and this is what it's so important to me as an Iranian American, as somebody who every day of Trump's presidency has feared that Trump would go to war with Iran and is now witnessing him go to war with America. With his own country. Uh, yes, I, I have. He is putting the military in the streets. I hope that Americans take note I hope they remember what this feels like to have the military in the streets Mm -hmm. and think twice before they go ahead and elect somebody who sends the military overseas because we may be Iranian or Iraqi or Afghani, but we are human beings Mm -hmm. and they do not have the right to come into our country, tell us how to run it, Mm -hmm. no matter how badly it's being run, look look how America is being run. (laughs) Um, You have no moral authority to tell us this, especially Mm -hmm. in Iran where they staged a coup in 1953 that over the U.S. The U.S. Um, staged The CAI it. staged a coup mm-hmm. that overthrew mm-hmm. a democratically elected leader who wanted to na- nationalize oil so that, God forbid, Iranians could benefit from their own natural resources. Uh, we have done this the world over. And what we are witnessing now, partly, is that coming home to roost. Uh, and right. I see in this generation, in this younger generation, so much hope. These mm-hmm. kids have been dealt the shittiest hand possible, and they are using it uh, in ways that I'm in awe of. As somebody who has been an activist since I was seven years old, staged my first protest at the age of seven, I am telling you, these kids are amazing. Mm-hmm. I have, and, and they, what they are doing, and they are kids, uh, they shouldn't have to be doing this, uh, mm-hmm. but they are leading it, and they are leading it with so much courage and insight and wisdom 
uh, that is far beyond their years because they've been forced into this situation uh, where the older generation understands that, you know, maybe we've achieved all these things through the civil rights movement. And certainly we have achieved certain things through the civil rights movement, uh, but they recognize in a way that I think some of the older generation does not the intersectionality here such Mm -hmm. that you cannot oppress me um, as a Muslim woman, uh, as an Iranian woman, without also affecting every other person. And this goes back to that connection. Connectedness. Well, connected. I was just about, I was just about right? to bring it back to connectedness. Because, exactly. Because it's also uh, me looking at it and watching others being oppressed. That is also oppressing me. Yes. That is also being the very fabric of the space we're all existing in. And it is forcefully trying to cut this connectedness. Uh, and I do hope that what comes out of it, I mean, I do believe that the foundation was shaky, not even shaky. It was yeah. rotted. It was wrong. It was bad. And right yeah. now that foundation is being shaken down to the core. And it is sort of reminding me now of this uh, poem that is in the book about inviting even this bad stuff in as a house guest. It's a guest in our home accepting this because what it's going to do, it's going to clean it out. It's going to clean out our soul. It's going to clean out our system. And we can start fresh and new. Yeah. Be more connected and we can be more who we are meant to be, not who we are told we must be. Yeah. And I think it's important when you see that. And so much of the book is going back to my ancestral inheritance, right? This is sort of literary teaching. And I think recognizing that as Americans, our ancestral inheritance was built on genocide and slavery. And these two sins are, are still here. It's historical and trauma. Exactly. Right. So so we cannot as a country progress unless not only do we recognize that this country is built on genocide and save, slavery, uh, but that we start making active reparations for that uh, in ways that put people who are indigenous and black in positions of power um, and compensate them the way they were never compensated. Um, for and there's no compensating for this, and it's no, funny it's not to compensation. See. Yeah, not there's compensation, there's reparation. Exactly. I think is that word that um, can can mean different things to different people, and you can always find the place where it mends as opposed to tears apart. But I want to bring so we're talking about this big political scope and the sort of universal connectedness of of us all. I kind of want to bring it into something else you talked about in the book. So we just taught, said historical trauma, but you brought in the the idea that your that historical trauma can happen in the womb. So when you were in the womb and your parents were go, seeing a war and having to flee a country, uh, and you had not even been born yet, you're sort of but you're yeah. gestating in that emotional stew, yeah. and even before you're really old enough to form words or ideas with words, you're experiencing having to relocate. And, and so we ourselves as a microcosm, an individual as a microcosm of what's happening way out there in the world is the same sort of thing is that we're born into and have already before birth experienced all kinds of trauma. Right. And so like, where does this experience that you've had of, of mental illness at, at, a diagnosis come from, we don't know, but it seems to me, I mean, talk to me a little bit about how you feel you got to the place that you did because your book talks about how you've gotten beyond the place that you were at. So was I, was I accurate in just saying that you were talking about the fact that a lot of this that you've gone through was even before you were born. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, my, my parents were, I was born in 1979, which is the year of the so-called Islamic revolution. And I say so-called because there's nothing Islamic about an Islamic state, uh, within Islam, there is a very important notion of niyat or intention. Uh, and specifically the Quran says you should never force religion. Um, there should be no coercion with religion is what it says. And, 
so any is Islamic state is actually the most un-Islamic state because it has to be secular. So you have the choice to be Muslim if that's what you want to be. Uh, so I think the trauma of that, of being born as a child of the revolution. Uh, and then as my, my mom, I was, my mom was pregnant with me. Uh, she, she's a physician, as I said, but she's a pathologist. So her life is generally slides and autopsies. Uh, so she was looking through slides mostly, uh, but forget there's no time for autopsies during revolution, right? Uh, during revolution, what you do is you, you sew up wounds. And so she was, you know, there, there were bullet wounds she was attending to, which is not what pathologists generally do. <laughs> they generally don't deal with living people. Um, uh, so, or living people like in front of them, right? They'll deal with portions, slides, uh, of, parts of them, but not the full human. Uh, so sewing up bullet wounds while she's, uh, pregnant with me was not something that we considered, you know, my family considered safe. And I say, we, like I, I was there, but I, I was, but I wasn't right? right. Um, and then they, my parents decided that it would be a good time for me, my mom to take a vacation <laughs> to the United States. Uh, and in that sense, I'm an anchor baby. Um, and I say, I use that word proudly. <laughs> Uh, and I, I was born here, not just born, but born two months early, fully developed, um, mm. which is strange, but I was very much in a rush to get out. I had like a full giant head of hair and I was, there was nothing it was two months early. Like you should be somewhat underdeveloped, but I was not. Mm. Um, and I think that's from that trauma of just feeling like you need to get out. <laughs> like mm. there's, there's, there's danger. And I think that is something I've carried with me throughout my mm -hmm. life. Throughout my life, my parents never taught me this, but every place I've ever lived, I have a plastic bag that is hidden, that has my passport, that has all my inoculation records, uh, that is everything I think I would need before I had to flee a country mm. uh, so I can grab it and leave. Uh, that's not something I was taught. You know, uh, and it's not something I ever anticipated, actually. I, I always knew that it was irrational. Now, it's no longer irrational. When you have a Muslim ban where people from Iran are no longer uh, welcome in the United States, mm -hmm. it's not irrational to think that they might start rounding us up. And when do you leave when that starts happening? So I, um, and certainly it's already started happening they, in terms of detaining people and wrongful detentions of Iranians specifically. Um, and others who, other Muslims who are on that uh, banned list of banned countries. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think partly what's so beautiful in being in this, <laughs> horrifying and beautiful, of being in this midst of this pandemic is it's a reminder that um, what matters doesn't see borders, doesn't see these, these borders do nothing for us. Um, mm -hmm. You can't stop a virus. You right. can't, like the, it, it doesn't say, oh, yeah. look, there's a border. It doesn't the say, oh, there's a border. Let me, <laughs> let me make sure to get my documents out. You know, I mean, right. um, right. and in a way, you know, we're all, uh, we're all aliens. They were all like, we're, we're all visitors here. And I, I just, and, and the rest of the earth is what we're supposed to be taking care of. Right. And I just think, we've gone so far from that and far from recognizing, and hopefully again with this pandemic, it's a matter of letting the earth rest a little from all our abuse. Right. Um, and it, it has rested, but at, uh, certainly not enough to such that, I don't know, three generations of humans will still be around and maybe it's good if they're not. But mm -hmm. I, I just think we have damaged this planet so severely um, that there is speaking of reparations, like there's a, there's a price, there's a price to pay. Um, and hopefully this is the universe setting itself back. Uh, right. And certainly for me, slowing down the mandatory slowing down that has been required, uh, by this specifically in the moment that this book happened to be released into the world that I spent five years of my life working on. Wow. Uh, and then was like, I'll plan a whole tour and then none of it can really happen. Uh, and Oh, you know, and again, it goes back to what I say in the book is like consistently in my life, I have found uh, that the beloved's plan has been better than mine in the end mm. when I can surrender to it. When I fail to surrender to it is when things go wrong. Um, and that's when I experience suffering. But when I'm able to accept that everything is exactly the way that it's supposed to be, even if I don't understand why. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's no, the need for anxiety sort of evaporates <laughs> pretty quickly um, if you know that it's the way that it's supposed to be. And again, that was that gift of that mystical experience that, you know, not only I have, but so many people with mental health conditions have experienced and without them, um, a gift worth listening to. Um, and the, the danger of criminalizing mental illness and only seeing the negative side of it uh, and only seeing it as illness and disability instead of gift uh, is that we are losing some really brilliant and extraordinary minds through telling them that they're not capable of things that they're absolutely super capable of. Um, right. So, which, which brings me to a couple of other chapters in your book. Fear is one of them. Disappointment is the other. So what you were starting to touch on about sort of the beloved's way is better than my way. And I just need to accept that, even though it's not necessarily always the way you want. Yeah. So that bring, that brings up disappointment. The idea of disappointment, the, the one thing that I had thought of as I was reading about disappointment and there's uh, talking about recognition and appreciation of it, if this is back to the house guest inviting these negative emotions into your soul and that cleanses your soul uh, and then it makes room for joy and celebration. I remember mm -hmm. that um, yeah. from the book. Uh, for me, what it made me think of is Zen Buddhism, which is a slightly different take on a similar thing, is you can't be disappointed if you don't attach to these impermanent things in this time, in this place. So if you are not attached and if you have no expectation, so if you don't expect to get that job, if you don't expect to you know, be accepted by somebody else, if you have no expectation, right. no judgment, no attachment, there is no disappointment. So are we getting to the same thing in a way? Uh, because I began to start thinking, wow, maybe being detached, not having attachment, disconnects us and I mm. and I love being connected this idea right yeah yeah so but yeah. I think it's it's detachment from the material world right okay, yes that yes, yes, it's yes, that yes. detachment that Agreed. attaches you spiritually right and and Rumi is totally on board with that Sufis um are sort of ascetics in a lot of ways so um it's a a notion that it, ultimately, you know, there's a uh, there's a Sufi parable where uh, he talks about uh, there. I'm not sure it's Rumi actually. It's it's a parable, but it may be Rumi. It may not be. So I don't want to say that. But uh, about a, a grape. There, there's uh, three people, and I'll give you languages that we understand, so we can work with. And one of them says, "I want a grape. I want grapes." And the other one says, "I want angur." And the other one says, "I want uvas." right? So you know what that means, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what, I'm just using our languages. So sure, sure. we have, so grapes, we know what they are. They're grapes. Angur is just grapes in Farsi. Uh, uvas is grapes in Spanish. So we're all looking for the same thing. You know, we're going, it's just, it happens to have a different name. Um, and, and that's very much Rumi's mentality is that we can call it by all these different names. Um, but ultimately we're just after the same thing. And you can get into so many fights being like, you know, grapes and angur sound like nothing alike, um, or uvas like sound nothing alike. They're so, they're so different. Uh, they're the exact same thing. <laughs> right. So, okay. So I, yeah. so in terms of connectedness, in terms mm -hmm. of, it's like an acceptance, if you will, yeah, I can see it. So it's like an acceptance and acceptance of others, realizing that there is really no difference. Yeah, yeah. So this book is, it's your journey and you bring us on your journey, but you are allowing these ideas rooted in these verses you allow, you're allow it, allowing each of us, each reader to take from it what is right for us. I mean, that's the feeling I got. I never felt like I was being hit over the head with anything. Um, it seemed like a gentle guidance because you were sharing yeah. as opposed to yeah. saying this is the way it should be. 
Because I don't oh. know the way it should be. If I knew, I would tell you, but it's not that well, it seems like. And, and it's changed, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. even though you're, so was your breakdown or breakthrough mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in your 20s? Um, it was at 29. 29. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you're now in your 30s. I am. And I, I will say I had another, I had a different mystical experience uh, when I was in, in my 20s and when I was in college as well, that was not as, uh, didn't have the negative consequences, but it was not as deep either. Um, but it, that wasn't my first mystical experience. I've had two of them. Okay. But okay. the second is the only one that led to, you know, <laughs> psychosis. So And hospitalization. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm, I'm also wondering if, you know, without being chronological about it, if this is almost life stages, that some mm. people go through an evolution, an internal evolution, at a much speedier way than others. And right. some people, I mean, I, I think we probably have all known people who we may have passed some judgment on them and said they're not evolved. <laughs> mm -hmm. And other people we say are highly evolved. Yeah, well, yeah. And maybe it's that they're passing through these stages and they are less and less separated from the connectedness, less and less separated right. from the spiritual because they are breaking down their ego and they're no longer attached. Like they recognize it first. Yes. Wow. Look yeah. at that. Why am I so angry? Why am I so scared? Why am I so this and that, that are preventing me from handling this? Because it's not just the material world that you get, that you need to be detached from. It seems it's detached from ego, yeah. which is a huge root. And also not be attached to how other people think of you or how right. other people feel or say that they feel about you because that's not about you. Right. It's about them. And that's a big yeah. lesson. And I don't think I learned that until my fifties. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking that a lot of what you have said in this book, I'm, I'm wondering 10 years from now and 10 years beyond that. Yeah how you've approached each of these, because I do feel they're universal. Yeah. I do feel yeah. that they are true. At least in my fifties, they, they, re, they ring true. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's cycles. Like we keep, yeah. there's no, there's no end. And that's what I figured out at the end of this book. And I'm figuring out every day. Cause my dad still calls me reciting poems and I'm like, we should translate this one. And I'm like, we're done. <laughs> he's like, no, he's like, you're never done. It's never done. No. And he, he very much throughout the book. And I say it in the book, like consistently when I was writing this book, you know, as a writer, this was, you know, this is how I make my career. Like this is my living. Uh, I have to actually sell books <laughs> to, to publishers. And, you know, so and as a nonfiction writer, we, we sell them generally before we finish writing them. Right. So I was in the moment of like deciding what I was what this idea and this concept was. And I only, you know, when we sold it, I only had written one of the chapters. So um, that sort of obsession with trying to sell the book uh, mm -hmm. was something that my dad was so against, uh, despite the fact that, you know, he wants me to have a livelihood, like he, he's all in favor of that. But he's like, this is not for a book. The book, he, the, his comparison is, he says, it's just like uh, wheat and hay. Uh, he'll say wheat, you grow wheat for wheat, right? You, you want the wheat, the actual nourishment from it. Uh, but one of the side effects is you get hay. Um, and, you know, some animals eat that and it's, it has its use uh, as well. Uh, but he was saying the book is the hay. It'll have a use for other people, mm -hmm. but you need to focus on the wheat, <laughs> um, which was, you know, the, and even just the seed. Uh, and so, that was really hard for me to accept. And all of these lessons throughout, it, there, it's something that I'm constantly going back and having to learn again. And all of these chapters and emotions that are in there, it's not like Rumi is saying, this is the cure for it and this is the end to it. No, this, it's more the way of interpreting it and how, how to exactly welcome it in a way that it can enlighten you so that you're not so attached to your own ego that you fail to recognize that you and I come from the same place, uh, mm -hmm. that you fail to recognize that there really is no me and no you. Uh, there's we, there's something greater. Uh, but this illusion that for, for Rumi, like this idea of self, like having a self uh, that's very distinct, which is so ingrained 
in the American mentality and the oh, American yeah. culture. Yeah. Um, this idea of self and like self-realization, self-actualization, it's all about self. Um, that doesn't really exist for him. Uh, it's because in the space of divinity, uh, which for him is what really matters, there is no, um, for God, there can be no uh, me and you. It's God is both of you. It's, uh, you can't separate yourself out like that. Mm. Um, there is no space uh, for the me when, when you are aware of the beloved. Um, and that's hard, I think. And I'm deeply American. I consider myself 100% Iranian and 100% American. So for me right. as an American... Like that's a hard thing because I, especially as an American with a mental health condition, like I, who, you know, goes to treatment and believes in it. Uh, it was very hard for me to be like that. The self doesn't matter. Like, w w and especially somebody who's really tied into identity politics and all of that, like it's, and uh, I see it as important and there's, you know, reasons in, related to injustice, why it's important to recognize those kinds of distinctions yeah. uh, in order to get rid of the injustices that surround them. But uh, Rumi is really not caught up with a lot of that. He's he's very much on a more evolved tire kind of level. Um, and I, it's, yeah. you wonder about people like that, how they actually survive in the real world, um, because it must have been hard. Uh, and, well, it, you, and it still is, and it's still yeah. hard. It's still absolutely hard yeah. for anybody who does think in a different way um, and is in touch with these things that we're talking about right now and, and very overt about it. There's something else. So, so on the one hand, it is no ego. There is no separation of self and the beloved, um, or s there is no separation between all of us. There's yeah. also the other part of it that's throughout the book is that the gold is within us. The light is within us. When you talked about enlightenment and gold, uh, that all seems hand in hand is that we tend to seek things outside of ourselves to feel Absolutely. good about ourselves when the truth of the matter is it's all within ourselves. What is the, that specific quote? I, t I promise I wasn't going to put you on. Um, that, yeah, I, know yeah. you, I know so you know that, that one. That is actually my favorite. Uh, ah. So yeah, it just turns out, works okay. out, huh? Yeah. Um, so the poem is in Farsi. It's Zar Talab Gashti Khud Aval Zar Budi, which means you went out in search of gold far and wide, but all along you were gold on the inside. Um, and that is in his, he goes on in that poem to say, you know, you, when you were younger, you understood this, um, <laughs> you've grown out of that. Like you no longer understand this. And now you think you need to do all these other things to be valuable. Um, and which, you know, applies to us today so much that like we, how do we be valuable in a capitalistic society um that values you know that i'm supposed to say this is my book buy it you need it you don't you don't you uh, what you, you have it already you. <laughs> yeah what you it's, wait, but that doesn't serve capitalism really right well. and i think um, you want you talk about that struggle too is exactly. that uh being the product being the brand that is selling the product that you yeah, are you have now work. been create you're no longer you you are this thing that is churning that capitalistic intent. Um, but I see it a little bit differently. Yes, you're a writer. You're making a living doing your writing. You have books and you do want to sell books because that is part of that process. But what you're really doing is you're opening yourself up. You're exposing your heart and your inner core to the world, whether that's courage, whether that's vulnerability. I mean, everyone calls it many different things. But it is still, in this very day and age, rare, mm -hmm. still feared by many, many people and railed against. And then, when, yeah, when people are afraid, they often become angry. That's sort of like this outcropping. Yeah. So uh, by making yourself open, that is a, that's a rare gift. That is a, and a, and a brilliant gift. It's just a question of whether the people, the humans <laughs> out there yeah. can open and receive. Yeah. 
And yet that's why you just, you can't view it like that as an artist. You, you, I don't think you can survive as an artist without letting that go to a certain extent and being like, well, you know, I, I hope my books, they're my children. I hope they help people. And I've received messages and emails and actually spoken to some people who've told me that my books have saved their lives. Like wow. it's just an extraordinary experience. Um, and especially when you write about mental health, right? Like you're dealing with issues of suicide and somebody often, you know, people feel alone in that um, struggle. Mm-hmm. And all you have to do is be honest. And then in your honesty, all you're saying is like, this is what I've dealt with. And right. suddenly other people are like, oh, I'm not alone in that. And and that knowledge of not being alone is life-saving. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> My parents were calling me. <laughs> um, I, I thought, I I would think that it would like cancel. No, I, we didn't see it on our end. Oh, so, you didn't but, see it. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so you would think that knowledge alone would be. <laughs> but... Well, uh, and it's interesting. So I, I will tell very briefly my, my story that I mentioned or alluded to before is um, I had been struggling for quite a long time and I finally went to a chiropractor hmm. because I thought it was physical pain. And she told me to see her sister, who is more of an energy worker. And, oh, like Reiki, kind of. Uh, kind of, kind of. It was so it, it was a no-name energy okay. thing. She just sort of channels and intuits what you, what she, what she senses from you, and then she does and or says. She says sometimes I talk and sometimes I don't. She says right now I think that you need me to talk. And so every session I had with her, she was mostly talking to me mm. and leading me and guiding me in a way. But the main thing that both of them said is, "You are so in your head, your heart is completely closed off." And until you integrate, until you open your heart and get out of your head and be somewhere in between there or be closer to your heart, you're going to have pain and resistance and struggle. And they even said to me, as soon as you are back in your heart, because we're born in our hearts, yeah, yeah. we learn to be in our heads, exactly. yeah. conditioned to be in our heads, but we're born in our hearts. So as soon as you return to your heart and you begin to share your story, and this is true for everybody, this is not just me. Yeah. As soon as we are in our hearts and share our stories, it they said they said that that is where you are going to find your place and your purpose, mm-hmm. and the connection will be strongest with all around you because that is that is what we seek. We seek to connect, and yet when you're super in your head. It is a huge barrier to, to genuine connection. And so they spent a year, literally a year, wow. trying to connect these things. And they would say, did you feel that? And I'd be like, yeah. what, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was so unaware. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't until uh, several years later, and I had not had any of these treatments. And these were like regular uh, sessions that I would have. And I hadn't had them for such a long time, but I went to, through some very, very deep struggles mm-hmm. that suddenly I thought, well, you know what, maybe if I stop thinking about it and start feeling mm-hmm. this out, I will find it. And so since then, my struggles are guided by heart. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a scary place to be because I'm a, such a logical. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, it's back to the connection. It's back to not facing or overcoming fear, but acknowledging fear yeah. and understanding where it comes from. We have a few minutes left. I was looking to see if anyone has any questions at the moment. Those of you who are watching live right now, feel free to type it into the chat. But I wanted to turn it back to you with, you know, obviously we want to talk about your book and we have, we've talked about what's happening in the world today and how it's a reflection well you say in your book which is so you talk about so much of the pain that we're currently going through in June 2020 (laughs) that you wrote about because you've been experiencing that because of the idea what was it it was lunatic or (laughs) mystic Mystic. yeah yeah so love (laughs) creates a a mystic but fear creates creates a lunatic it's a different kind of madness because Rumi promotes madness but he promotes the kind, he says, I'm in love with madness. Uh, but that is the kind of madness that creates a mystic. 
And that is the kind of madness that comes out of love. There's a different kind of madness that comes out of fear. And that is what creates a lunatic. And that is unfortunately who is leading our country right now. So we, we are being um, led entirely by fear and yes. hopefully whatever is. And it's not that you're not capable. I want to say like, it's not that right. somebody who's led by fear isn't capable of coming around to the heart. Even somebody like that, you know, somebody who's caused so much damage. Uh, you think about the people who cause the most damage in the world are often the people who are most damaged inside. Yes. Uh, and unfortunately they're unable right. to, to deal with that themselves. So you look at our, the current leader of the so-called free world, which is not really happening right now. And you think someone like Donald Trump, like what's, what's happening within, is he, is he capable of this? And plenty of people have asked me this specifically. Like is he capable of love? Is he right. Like love? why you can't love him. Like there's no way that you could love someone like him. Um, but it's a kind of, it, Rumi would, would disagree. Rumi would say, not only is there a way to love someone like him, there's also a way for him to love. And I think the the way that you get somebody that that is that spiritually immature and that desperate 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 for validation um is something at all costs at, at, all, at costs, all costs right like somebody mm-hmm. who's you feel sorry for him a little bit if he weren't killing so many people <laughs> well okay so wait um, just, yeah I'll finish your thought and then I'm going to tell you what it just reminds me of yeah. No, I mean, again, you would, you would just feel sorry for him, but at the yeah. same time, it's if, if, if he weren't causing so much destruction, uh, mm-hmm. but the people, again, it's those people who cause the most destruction that are most in need of love. They're, uh, they're most the, in pain. Exactly. And they're the people who could benefit the most from it. Uh, they're also the people that it's hardest to love. Yeah. Uh, so it takes a highly spiritually evolved person to be able to bring someone like that over. And unfortunately, he hasn't really surrounded himself with very spiritually evolved people. Right, (laughs) right. So this, and then what I was gonna say, this reminds me of something very simple. As a mom, I've got two teenagers and a toddler. And as a mom, I told my kids, particularly my daughter, I was so worried about the mean girl phase where the girls just uh, eviscerate each other. They're so, so mean. But I, would, I said to her from the start, from when she started going to school, there are people out there who are called bullies, and they are going to attack everyone around them. Always keep in mind that the bully is a, is a child who is so hurt and in yeah. so much pain. And the only way they think they can get better is by causing so much pain outside of them yeah. to distract them from their own pain. Yeah. I said that child could be abused. That child is yeah. probably being bullied at home. That child is hurting. So let's have some compassion. Let us be gentle with that bully because nobody's being nice to yeah. them. Yeah. So that is a lesson hard work. I've tried. Oh, so hard work. It's very and hard work. Yeah. And then the repercussions of being bullied, they're just ripples and ripples of pain that then hurt so many others. The flip side, and this is really what your book, I think, has said over and over again, the ripple effect of love, mm. so yeah. powerful and so uniting. Yeah. I thank you so much. Leave us with, I know we've already given us your favorite. Can you leave us with another verse uh, that you would like to share? Mm. Um, This, I think this one is more from the, when I was talking about the grapes. Um, (laughs) So uh, Rumi says that it's names and labels that make us disagree look beneath the words and find peace with me. Um, I'll leave it on that. I like, I like that. Thank you so much. This is. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really just, appreciate this. Yeah. And I do as well. This has been, you know, everything happens for a reason. We're all in the place that we are. And I think a beautiful thing about the book is that it helps us reframe the way we're looking at a lot of things and I what I I will just make my judgment that it is in a healthier way Mm -hmm. it's in a more accepting way and it's in a more grounding way Uh, and more than anything 
it brings us back to love and it brings us back to ourselves. And I think that's just a beautiful thing. Um, I will do the <laughs> promoting, promoting. beautiful you. book, amazing author, incredible stories and, and food. food. <laughs> Food for You're thought. not the only one to catch that, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and, and it's actually food, literally a lot of food. <laughs> there is a lot of food in there, and food of yeah. names and that I don't know. And I love how you have all the footnotes, and I love in the back how you explain the stew and and all of the different um, foods that are in your home yeah. um, that you grew up with, and how yeah, it, it's a, it's a nourishing book. <laughs> it's a nourishing book on so many levels. Where are the recipes? That's what I. <laughs> Yeah, you're all you're not the first one. <laughs> so, well, maybe hey, maybe, one day, maybe. maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, you take good care. Thank you. Thanks Thank you so much, me. Lisa. And uh, hopefully we will continue to see more from you. I, it's funny. It's like when I lived in New York City. It's such a big city and so, so many people. And then you meet someone and suddenly you see them on the street, like all the time. You like <laughs> run into them yeah. all the time. It's like this energy and connection. Um, so I'm sure I'm going to see you many yes. times over um, along the way. So good luck with to your it. journey. Likewise. Thank Everything. you so much for having me. All right. Take care now. 